It's Monday. It's March 11th. And the word of the day is fartalik, a Swedish form of interval training for long-distance runners. I feel like some Swedish guy convinced you of that after you didn't seem interested in this kink, but okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's like the final lap of the race once all those protein drinks like really kick in. That's the fart leg of the race. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> all right. No, that's fair. I'm no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Michael Marshall, and broadcasting delayed from America's far center, we are the Skeptocrats. On this week's episode, Joe Biden tries to find a united state. New York tries to make itself safer by adding more guns. And the UK once again shows it cannot be trusted with a Princess of Wales. Oh no. <laughs> but first, the rest of the intro music. <laughs> Joining me for headlines tonight are my fellow skeptic rats, Michael Marshall and Eli Bosnick. Gentlemen, is the singular form of Heath Hooth, as in there's not a single Hooth on this show today? Uh, and if so, do bad puns give you a Hoothache? <laughs> uh, it's hard to say because, you know, I don't really plan my wordplay. I kind of tend to come up with it on the hoof. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. In our lead story tonight... Joe Biden delivered the last State of the Union address of his first term on Thursday. And if you had your money on strong, congratulations. It was strong. Uh, <laughs> he started the speech with World War II because he wanted to give people a notion right off the bat about the time scale his remarks were going to unfold over. But yes, his opening salvo was essentially Donald Trump is the worst thing since Hitler. And that strikes me as pretty reasonable, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, he didn't even say the only reason he isn't worse is because you sucked it up and voted for me, so do it again. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm calling it now. Trump is worse than Hitler because Hitler is the only person in history to have ever actually killed Adolf Hitler. And oh, he, he, he doesn't get enough credit for that. You know, lots of people tried. He's the only one who succeeded. No, you're right. You're right. All I'm saying is Trump can learn a lot from him on that front. <laughs> <laughs> do you want history to love you, Trump? Because it's not too late. <laughs> Um, now, you're going to see mixed reviews of his speech in the news, but mostly that's because of the insane anti-Biden media bias that stems from, you know, the marriage between the profitability of Trump's chaos for news agencies and the profitability of Trump's policies for all the conglomerates that own those news agencies. But it was a damn strong speech, one of the best of his career. Uh, he highlighted his accomplishments. He drew a stark contrast between him and the other team, and he clearly articulated his goals for a second term. But... On the other hand, you know, he also said GPT when he meant GDP. So you can see why the reviews are lukewarm. Seriously. Look, nobody is saying Joe Biden isn't old. Nobody's saying he's at the razor's edge of technology or politics. What he is saying is that he's got a perfect record at beating Donald Trump in presidential elections. And that's before Trump tried to overthrow the government. So yes. maybe he deserves just a little bit of our faith. What do you think? A little bit? A little bit. Right. And like Biden, he might have said GPT when he meant GDP, but at least you'd back him to know what either of those things were, which yes, put him way right. up on Trump. Yep, absolutely. Um, by far, though, the best moments in the speech were when he used angry peanut gallery Republicans as unwitting props. That, that happened actually several times, but it was most notable when he was talking about the border security bill that Republicans voted against, despite it containing literally everything that they're asking for. He, he managed to come off as combating but not combative. As weird as that sounds, like, like, remember the vice presidential debate where he just kept laughing at everything Paul Ryan said? It reminded me a lot of that. Yeah. And to be fair, he could have just been remembering how funny the first Charlie Chaplin film was when he saw it at its premiere. So, you right. know, there's yeah, a lot whatever. of things he could have been gay. <laughs> whatever it was. But, of course, Biden's speech was easily overshadowed by the Republican rebuttal. And not in a good way. So, <laughs> the rebuttal featured Alabama Senator Katie Britt, a person described as a rising star in the Republican Party the day before uh, the rebuttal, not not so much after. Well, fallen um, star was taken. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, no, like her star fell quite a bit because she delivered the speech as though she came home way too drunk to read the bedtime story, but insisted on doing it anyway. <laughs> right. Her voice is just wavering between giving the manager a stern talking to and fairy tale peril the entire fucking time. Meanwhile, her facial expressions are off on their own little adventure, presumably trying to go through all possible emotions alphabetically. <laughs> yeah. Which is extra hard for an Alabama senator because it means first remembering the whole alphabet. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> 
It's like she read that quote about fascism being the combination of irrational emotionalism and nationalism, and she thought it was acting direction. She was like, okay, I can do I can do this. No, so yeah, the clear goal in choosing Brit was to distance the Republican Party from the misogynist label that's been dogging them all the more, I guess, ever since Roe was overturned. Um, this goal was severely undercut by whatever dumbass convinced her to deliver that speech from her kitchen. Right. Like, I mean, I'm sure they thought they were doing a like, oh, look, we could all just be sitting around the house after the speech chatting about it vibe. But it comes across as a I'm a woman in my natural environment kind of thing, which did not help at all. Oh, hello. Didn't see you there over my female privilege. It's so nice and warm <laughs> in here. The thing is, was she even actually in her kitchen? Because the whole background's got this like blurry quality of like a Zoom stock background to it. Mm-hmm. Like it was digitally added after the fact, presumably when Republican strategists realised their voters would be confused if they saw a lady not in a kitchen and just right. wouldn't have listened. Yeah, it could have been that too. Yeah. So, yeah, but it wasn't just her delivery and her location that were batshit. The content of her speech was hilariously inept as well. Uh, Speaking of the U.S. border with Mexico, at one point she said Biden inherited, quote, the most secure border of all time. Which, obviously it's not true, but that's not a competition you want to (laughs) win, right? Other contenders, no doubt, would include the fucking Korean demilitarized zone in the Berlin goddamn wall. That's what I was thinking (laughs) of, yeah. (laughs) And in an obvious nod to QAnon, she then tells this harrowing tale of a Mexican rape victim in her effort to get a rapist reelected to the presidency. Yeah, and the New York Times actually put out an article on Saturday pointing out that the sex trafficking victim never left Mexico and still haven't. So I'm not sure how her situation was supposed to be Joe Biden's fault. Right? Right, Yeah, like worse than that, the victim was trafficked in Guadalajara in 2004 when Bush was president of the US. So the criticism here is, why couldn't Biden keep central Mexico free from sex crimes during a Republican (laughs) presidency? (laughs) Yes. And in perhaps the most telling moment in the entire speech, she asks towards the end if we feel like we're better off than we were three years ago, (laughs) which is a weird number of years to choose since Joe Biden was the goddamn president three years ago, right? But she can't say four years ago because then she's asking if we're better off back in the impromptu ice truck morgue days and she can't that that's not gonna get her the answer she was. So I'm guessing there was an earlier draft in this that said, Are you better off than you were three point three seven eight years ago? And then like <laughs> this was the compromise. Yeah. Th- are you happier than you were three years ago? But please do not think about how you felt between 2015 and 2020. Please yes. do not think about those differences. I'm begging you. <laughs> but to be fair, a chunk of Republicans can honestly say they're not better off than they were three years ago, but mostly because they're in prison for trying to overthrow the government on January 6th. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, right, That's right. true. You're an empath, Marsh. I've always said that about <laughs> you. And look, I-, I get that I'm not an objective voice on this one, right? My job more or less demands that I exaggerate on this kind of shit. So I think it's worth noting that like Rolling Stone quoted an unnamed Trump advisor responding to this speech by saying, quote, what the hell am I watching right now? And, <laughs> nice. and a similarly unnamed strategist told the Daily Beast the speech was, quote, one of our biggest disasters ever, end quote. Yeah, tall Tyler behind the camera silently trying to slit his throat with the cue cards again. <laughs> yeah, <just> right. <laughs> <laughs> we rounded the, the way- edges, big dog. You can't do it. <laughs> And by the way, if you still need an objective reason to hate this woman beyond her being a Republican senator in 2024, I should point out that her daughter's name is Bennett and her son's name is Ridgeway. So I'm sorry, if that doesn't do it, I don't think anything will. Sounds like Marsh's opponent's soccer team. Yeah, right? <laughs> I mean, Ridgeway Brit is definitely the, the name of a UK-themed dildo. There's no right. way it isn't. <laughs> oh, lab, why don't we draw to Ridgeway to not? <laughs> and since our advertisers always love dildo segues, it's time to stop for a quick word from our first sponsor this week, BetterHelp. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. But then, when Liberty wants to go into Mayor Humdinger's rally, she just sneaks in. Mmm. Hey guys, what are you doing? I'm telling Marsh about my issues with the Paw Patrol movie. Yeah, and he has been for the last two hours. 
Yeah, yeah, I see. Eli, it occurs to me that your priorities might be slightly out of balance. <laughs> okay, if calling out River for the rainbow fascism apology they represent is out of balance, then yeah, I'm out of balance. Okay, so have you thought about therapy? Therapy? For my priorities? That's right. Therapy can help you find what matters to you, so you can do more of it. And if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. So, no awkward therapist breakups? No awkward therapist breakups. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Skeptocrat today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Skeptocrat. BetterHelp. Because you might want to think about where you're spending your focus. The dog is named Liberty, Marsh. Liberty. Or not. Or not. You know. And we're back. Next up in headlines in Irrational Guard News. If you're unfamiliar with the politics of my beloved New York City and New York State, here's how it goes. Uh, the vast majority of people who live in both the city and the state are very, very liberal. And so when it's time for politicians to run for office, they appeal to those liberals, obviously. But when it's time to actually govern, those politicians turn to the state's tiny but powerful cabal of conservatives who will get them paid. The result is candidates who run on far-left policies while slashing teacher salaries, social services, and the like. In other words, it's a great microcosm of America. <laughs> yeah, except the bit about the vast majority of people being very, very liberal. <laughs> right. And, well, and the part about the cabal of powerful conservatives being tiny. Actually, I think it's less of a microcosm of America and just like a regular cosm of the blue states. Just sure. Just like <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's fair. But... Occasionally, as is with the case with the larger nation, these slashes and cuts start to be felt by the people doing them, which is why Governor Kathy Hochul is deploying 1,000 members of the state police and National Guard to the New York City transit system to outcop a recent series of violent crimes. Right, yeah, because the one thing wrong with American police is that they're not military enough. Yep. Uh, well, this man can only think of three different ways to kill me right now. He's nowhere near dangerous <laughs> enough to protect <laughs> I, me. Yeah. None of them are with just a comb. Well, yeah, and, and that's what's wrong with American cops in general. But what's wrong with like New York City cops in particular is that they don't harass enough people on their way into the subway. So. Yes. <laughs> we were all missing the stop and frisk era, apparently. So... Yeah, if you're unfamiliar about why this feels needed right now, uh, let me oversimplify it for you. Uh, you know ranked choice voting? It's great, right? Eliminates the spoiler effect, gives candidates more information about the opinion of voters, empowers smaller parties. The problem is, I don't know if you know this, but the compromise between liberals and conservatives in America is conservatives. <laughs> Conservatives yeah. like Eric mm -hmm. Adams, who has spent almost his entire tenure up for mayor trying to convince voters they accidentally elected Texas Governor Greg Abbott. Yeah. So, to be clear, approval voting is far better than ranked choice voting because, like, if for no other reason than American voters are deeply, deeply stupid. But, like, your, your point stands regardless. Yes. Uh, yeah. There are a lot of better systems. And wouldn't you know it, cutting social services, mental health services, jobs, and support has resulted in more unhoused people, many of huh. whom are in mental health crisis. And I don't know if you've ever been in mental health crisis and unhoused at the same time, but you tend not to do a great job at following laws when you feel that way. So there's been a spike in crime along with several prominent attacks, one of which prompted a walkout by the subway operators early in the month because... They should have protection besides that little train conductor hat that we give them. Sure. No, that's yeah. fair. I mean, at least in the UK, we also give them a whistle, you know, so they can make a noise for <laughs> regular people to ignore and just tut about while they're getting beaten up. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, the good news is that New York State is actually doing several good things about the problem, right? The state has paid $20 million to pay for 10 teams of mental health care workers who will help people in need on the subway. They're going to add cameras to the train conductor's control booths and coordinate with prosecutors to track repeat offenders. But that is all way too nice for the conservatives. So, as I said, she is also deploying a thousand state cops and National Guardsmen into the train system to check people's bags. Because if you're going to ride the train, why not do it without your civil rights, huh? 
Mm, hey, mm. I'm used to the British rail network. You know, you could waterboard me and then put me in one of those naked pyramid things as long as in return I don't have to wait yet another fucking hour at Euston Station <laughs> because <laughs> the train company somehow couldn't find enough drivers. <laughs> All right, so I'm not sure exactly what naked pyramid thing you have in mind, Marsh, but if it's the one I'm thinking of, I'll drive you wherever you need to get, boo. Heck yeah, <laughs> yeah. Are you picturing the Michael Motion juggling yes, pyramid? Yes, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. So yeah, uh, prediction time, and I know this one's a doozy, so everybody write it down. Hold me to this. Uh, putting a bunch of untrained outsider cops into the New York City is not actually going to result in less violence. It's going to result in more violence. It's just going to be against poor, mentally ill, and unhoused people. But hey, yeah. at least Eric Adams can safely ride the train to his home in Brooklyn that he super duper actually lives in. Oh, yeah. It's a- <laughs> <laughs> One of my neighbors, old Eric E. And in Royal Hush News... Cast your mind back two short episodes ago when I, the humble UK correspondent, said that Britain was about to declare itself fully independent from sanity over King Prince Charles having cancer. Um, Well, an important part of being a sceptic is being willing to admit when you're wrong. uh, And in that spirit, I hold my hands up, full mea culpa, uh, because we didn't lose our minds over the health of King Prince Charles. We went fully unhinged over the health of Princess Kate Middleton instead. Mm -hmm. Yes. Or as you all know, her former teen bop sensation, Avra Levine. What? What? I I feel like... I feel like you're overestimating how hinged your countrymen were before this news <laughs> broke, Marsh. Thank but I accept you. The yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, for all those who haven't been following the lines of red yarn all the way back to Kensington Palace, Kate Middleton, the wife to the heir of the throne, hasn't been seen in public for over two months. And the internet has a lot of theories as to why that is. None of those theories explain why we should even care about this or or even why we still have princesses and kings in the year of our Lord 2024 <laughs> when there are literally people taking out their portable supercomputer devices and then using those devices to scroll for stories about the family chosen by God to sit on the special chair in the special building. Like We are not a serious country and we should not be allowed to be in charge of things. I mean, the rest of the world was pretty firm with you on that second rule, Marsh. There's no acting like you <laughs> came up with it now. <laughs> Yeah, the funniest part is that you don't even have a farcical aquatic ceremony, right? <laughs> like, st- strange women lying in ponds distributing swords would actually be a better system than what you're doing now. Yeah, so 100%. She's gonna, she's gonna toss them to different bloodlines eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Still, here's what we do actually know. So Kate was last seen on Christmas Day, uh, apparently healthy, but then a few days later she went into hospital for an unexpected appointment. And then on January 17th she was back in hospital for abdominal surgery. Nobody thought that much about it at the time because it was the exact same day that we found out that King Prince Charles had cancer. And and it turns out he was actually in the very same hospital as Kate, which in hindsight, isn't that a bit too convenient, if anything? (laughs) Yeah, deep state assassins running into each other at the vending machines. I'm sorry, Steve, are you working today? Oh my God, how the hell are you? Get in here, buddy. So a month goes by and we still haven't seen Kate at this point, um, which might not seem all that unusual because there's like loads of months where I don't see or even think about Kate Middleton. But no, apparently it isn't like that. This is very suspicious instead. Okay, first of all, Marsh, I think of Kate Middleton every time I lay down to sleep with my life-size body pillow of her in between my wife and I as God (laughs) intended. So please don't speak to everyone's experience about this. Oh, so to be clear, listeners, there was never a second of all. I'm, I'm, not sure if, I'm not sure if Eli just forgot how he'd formatted the first half of his sentence or if he knew I'd edit out any second of all that came after his Kate Middleton fuck doll comment. But it's it, there's not something on the cutting room floor that you're Body pillow. Out. It's not sexual. It's about okay. comfort. So then February 25th, <laughs> boom, Thomas Kingston is found dead. Just to explain, he's the son-in-law of Baroness Mary Christine von Riebnitz, a.k.a. Princess Michael of Kent, a.k.a. the wife of the cousin of Queen Elizabeth II. So, you know, this is very significant stuff. Yeah, his assassination was a while you're out, will you get more Diet Cokes kind of thing, right? They took care of it on the way. (laughs) So what does all of this mean? Well, according to the internet, it means that Kate Middleton is dead or she's very ill. 
or according to an unnamed Spanish journalist, which is obviously the most reliable source of intel on the British royal family. That's what I use, yeah. She's actually in a coma this whole time. Oh. oh. Well, so I'm, I'm honestly just glad they don't think she's really Thomas Kingston in a wig. It, it, it means that there's still a higher gear of insanity that this can shift into for a follow-up story. So. Right. Um, or, or it could mean in all of this that she filed for divorce because William's cheating on her, but the family won't allow William to be un married, especially if King Prince Charles is actually dying, and so they locked Kate up in order to stop her leaving him. Or it was Kate that was having the, the affair with Thomas Kingston, <gasps> who then William got into a fight with, which resulted in Kingston choking William, which is why Wills was pictured at a public event with what was either a badly bruised cheek from a fight or, you know, a shadow on his face. But either way, <laughs> William definitely shot Kingston in retaliation, but can't go to prison because he's going to be king. But he is still holding Kate hostage because she's pregnant and it's Kingston's child. Oh, God. that's good. Oh, the imagination of your mentally ill is so much more interesting than the truth, which is sick rich lady don't have to leave mansion. Right, exactly. Right, right. By the way, great rule of thumb on whether you're dealing with a real thing or conspiracy bullshit. Over time, does it narrow down on a single answer? Does it just expand out like a desperate writer's room trying to think of something new to do with a 14-year-old soap opera? <laughs> Well, on that topic, Noah, she could also be apparently pregnant, <laughs> but the father is actually King Prince Charles himself, because oh, why <laughs> else would they be in the same hospital at the same time? Sure. <laughs> or possibly, as to one bit of speculation, the baby is Roger Federer's, because apparently she flirted with him at Wimbledon on live television right in front of Federer's wife, which definitely means she's having his baby. I mean, those ones are whimsical, at least. I like the whimsy yeah, of those. Yeah, right. And yeah. we haven't even started into this she's pregnant with a Jewish lizard alien level of conspiracies, and I'm sure those are out there too. So. <laughs> and so through all of this, something just doesn't smell right, because according to one Twitter user who speculated... You're telling me that Kate Middleton, the same woman who posed outside the hospital like a freaking supermodel mere hours after giving birth, suddenly requires months of recovery before showing her face? This feels sinister, unquote. And, you know, they're right, because why wouldn't Kate do her surgery recovery in public, where the loyal <laughs> British subjects are so clearly capable of responding to royal health stories with reason and proportionality? Because if you ask me, Kate actually owes it to her country to convalesce openly in the public square. Right, we could hire that glass box that David Blaine had like a few decades ago <laughs> and she can recuperate from surgery while suspended 20 feet above the River Thames. There you go. Look, I know you're joking, but given how much the loyal British subjects are paying her to live in their fanciest house, I don't think that's unreasonable at <laughs> all, honestly. Fair. I also liked that by accident, he, Marsh turned scouse as he was reading that Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Is a thing, love, all right? Like he starts kneading <laughs> bread in front of him on his desk that doesn't exist. <laughs> you earn it from me first now, love. <laughs> I'm enjoying what you think Scouse is, Eli. Yeah, I'm right. very much enjoying I, what so you here's think the thing. I didn't know the word. Since I thought I used a British anachronism the other day, and Heath was like, I don't think we're allowed to say that anymore. But I was sure Scouse was not a slur, so that's why I went <laughs> Scouse is not a slur. Eli gets certain number of so points just for not using a slur. Accuracy not for is a secondary a slur, consideration yeah. for us here. <laughs> Thank you. So the royal family have remained fairly quiet about Kate's whereabouts through all of this uh, for reasons that are definitely suspicious and definitely aren't just respecting the privacy of a mother of three while she recovers from surgery. Um, but in the end, that silence, it couldn't hold. And they released a photo of Kate in a car. Uh, and this, not even this was enough for the internet because they pointed out that she didn't look like the Kate that we normally see. You know, the one who hasn't just recently had a really serious surgical operation and therefore it must be fake or a lookalike or a dummy or like a weekend at Bernie situation, I guess. Oh, Something okay. like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, they want the long form photo of her in a car. I get it. I get it. Yeah. How far out do you think they go with the clones slash body doubles? Does it end at Dukes or are they like getting all the cousins and everything? <laughs> They actually did release another picture of Kate to show that she's well around three of her kids, like her three kids there. And you'd think that would do it. But unfortunately, for some reason, her son in the photo has his fingers crossed. And so the Internet remains completely unhinged, <laughs> even with that genuinely true. It came out today. <laughs> A lot of silent communication with his handlers, <laughs> as Kate Middleton's son is doing. 
So whatever's happened to Kate, the speculation, it doesn't seem to be stopping anytime soon. And I think that's a shame because I've got a lot of respect for Kate Middleton because she's done something that I, I really, really admire. Namely, she's completely fucking disappeared, which like, <laughs> if only we could get more of the royal family to follow suit, I'd be a big fan. Fair. And on that note of baseless speculation around someone's serious health issues, a word from our sponsor, Policy Genius. Uh, you guys wanted to see me? Oh, hey, Marsh, uh, come on in. Yeah, is, is everything all right? Yeah, look, man, we're so grateful and excited that you and Nicola are joining us for our company get-together, but we want to make sure that you guys are prepared. Mm-hmm. Prepared? For, for what? Who knows? Milk leg, falling pianos. Holding a giant bomb that explodes in your face. Yes. Guys, lots of people get chicken pox. It's really common. Yeah, sure they do, Marsh. But... Just in case, you might want to look into Policy Genius. What's Policy Genius? Policy Genius's technology makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks to find your lowest price. Even if you already have a life insurance policy through work, it may not offer enough protection for your family's needs, and it may not follow you if you leave your job. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer same day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Plus, Policy Genius has licensed award winning agents who can help you find the best fit for your needs. And they work for you, not the insurance companies. That means they don't have an incentive to recommend one insurer over the other, so you can trust their guidance. I mean, that sounds great, but guys, save time and money and provide your family with a financial safety net using Policy Genius. Head to policygenius.com or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com. Policy Genius, because you never know when someone in your family will eat a bunch of dynamite. I'm going to tell Nicola you guys wrote this. Don't. Dude, she will walk through our spines. Yeah. And we're back. Next up in headlines, in unidentified ass pussy news, right? Because it's a <laughs> whap. Um, apparently, we hadn't already spent enough of our goddamn tax dollars checking to see if we're being visited by aliens from outer goddamn space because the Pentagon just released yet another, yeah, we checked it's not little green men this time either report last week, <laughs> which, like the long and storied series of reports dating back more than a fucking half century now, convinced absolutely no nobody of anything and proved to be a waste of time in both fucking directions yeah i mean at this point my question is who keeps saying yes it's like if checking for monsters under your kid's bed cost a hundred million dollars every time you did it (laughs) right but given what else the pentagon tends to spend the world's largest military budget on i'd rather they did keep saying yes to the are they nearly here yet question than to find like Another sandy country that needs democratizing into oblivion. This is a right. better, better thing. No, that's actually that's a great point. So just to be clear here, this is 100% the byproduct of electing crazy people to Congress. Um, so is the stuff that Marsh is talking about, really, but that's just <laughs> off subject. Um, but so look, when an unidentified aircraft enters into American airspace, you can bet your ass that the Pentagon figures out exactly what the fuck it is with zero prompting by the anal probe caucus. But despite that, and a, it definitely is an alien report by the Pentagon being released as recently as 2022, the 2023 National Defense Authorization Act included a requirement that they piss still more time and resources down this hole and provide a report to Congress of all government records related to UFOs since 1945, except they now say UAP because, you know, they think that they're going to sound less stupid if they regularly change up their initialism. I mean, I hate to argue with you, Noah, but fucking up the SEO of bullshit is probably doing more work than explaining to us that we're crazy for the 17th (laughs) time. Okay, yeah. Also, it means those, like, ufologists have to update the name of their profession to you apologists so it's definitely no, definitely worth it. See? i like it i like it and and lest you think well at least we have a temporary reprieve now from wasting our limited national resources on this shit i should emphasize that what was released on friday was only volume one of the eventual two volume report Right, they're stretching this out worse than the makers of June by this point. Yeah. Not, you could not okay. get that story. If in one you minute. had a human worm at the end of your story, you'd stall too, Marsh. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy it while it lasts, baby. His son wrote like 19 bucks. <laughs> Spoilers. So 
Th- this comes to us from the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, or AARO, a department of the Pentagon that exists solely to say it's not aliens again every time a video of dust on a camera lens goes viral. And they summarize their findings as follows, quote, AARO found no evidence that any USG investigation, that's U.S. government investigation, academic sponsored research, or official review panel has confirmed that any sighting of a UAP represented extraterrestrial technology, end quote, not adding, quote, fucking dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Marsh, do you know how we can get this job? I feel like you could pre-write a bunch of your reports, take a big chunk of the year off. Sure, yeah. yeah. Right, like, if I did, day one is setting up an auto-reply on my inbox saying, no, that's not an alien. And then the rest <laughs> of my time is spent convincing them to go with ADARO, which is a much, it's clearly a much better acronym than ARO. You've already got the yep. D. Use yes, the D. Yes, right. Yes, obviously. As, as Marsh so often tells me. Yeah. <laughs> now, of course... <laughs> UFO enthusiasts are either dismissing this report entirely as government propaganda or they're seizing on the necessary inclusion of words like most, right? As in, quote, although many UAP reports remain unsolved or unidentified, AARO assesses that if more or better quality data were available, most of these cases also could be identified and resolved as ordinary objects or phenomena, end quote. The rebuttal being of course, see most, right? <laughs> As though they're saying that some of these reports would defy explanation regardless of the amount of data yeah. obtained. Okay, but when you consider that the hypothesis of people who think that aliens have visited us is impossible, according to the laws of physics, you can see why that's what they're hoping for, right? Is sure. an unexplainable... Yeah, but not that most thing. I think that's Aro's fault because logically you could identify all of these things if enough data was available. That's what enough means. Like if you're given <laughs> the social security number and the inside leg measurement of the pilot of every one of those vehicles, the U part of UAP by definition would go away. Yep. Yeah. And I should also point out that there's a classified version of this report, right? Like there's a version that you and I can access, but there's also one that presumably contains shit like. Yeah, no, we actually just have a missile that can do that now. Um, (laughs) Which means that people so stupid that they think the man is hiding the truth from them even when they're elected to be the man are now being shown missile secrets and shit in an effort to assuage their fears that they're not going to be taken away by the greys. That should terrify you way more than if it was aliens. (laughs) Do you think there's a moment where like the guy doesn't let go of the binder when he hands it to Marjorie Taylor Greene, right? Like I feel like there's only so much right, right. you can you can untrain the human body for him to just be like, no, <laughs> I don't know. You gotta have someone else do this. I have, I'm to, not. I have to curl around this report and set myself on fire. Now I'm so sorry. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> and in V2 news. The Veteran Affairs Secretary has reversed a department memo that aimed to remove the iconic VJ Day in Times Square photograph from VA displays because, damn it, this is America. And if there's a better symbol of our country than sexually assaulting a stranger to celebrate the deaths of your enemies, we haven't heard of it. The the nuking of your enemies, no less. Yeah. uh Yeah. If only they somehow also had to tip that stranger 20% for the privilege, they'd have the American experience (laughs) in a microcosm there. (laughs) Finishes kissing her without consent. Okay, it's just going to ask you a few questions. Um... Yeah, tip. so VJ Day in Times Square, which many of you probably know as The Kiss, or that photo of that sailor kissing a nurse while very clearly putting her into a headlock, is not great. The nurse in the photo has described the incident by saying, quote, It wasn't my choice to be kissed. The guy just came over and kissed or grabbed, end quote. And that's a 1940s lady saying that, yep. okay? This is the generation that has described the Holocaust as kind of a bummer. Right, no, we're, t- we're talking about a generation that literally put asbestos in their cigarette filters, <laughs> right? Thinking about how bad something had to be for anyone to speak up about anything back then. Right, but in fairness, it's really hard to speak up after you've smoked enough asbestos-flavored cigarettes. It's <laughs> sure, really, yeah, no, really, it'll hush you up. <laughs> so, Oops. yeah. Very reasonably, a VA assistant undersecretary requested the photo's removal from all VA facilities in an internal memo. 
and someone within the VA was so incensed at not having a monument to non-consensual smooches on the walls that they leaked that memo to the conservative press, who, you guessed it, had a major fucking meltdown over it. So insane that just hours later, Secretary Dennis McDonough tweeted out a copy of the image with the caption, let me be clear, this image is not banned from VA facilities and we will keep it in VA facilities. So where it's like the conservatives are very concerned that you have their consent in these affairs. God damn it. This fight, they fucked that up again. Right. And it's also, though, because like non-consensual touching isn't just the symbol of the modern conservative movement. It's actually the whole political platform. Like if you no, get rid true. of that, they've yeah. got nothing left. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. Uh, so, yeah, the assault photo is safe, everybody. Close one. Also, the VA has a psychopath who leaks internal information to the press, which I find way more concerning because, of course, the author of that memo has now received all sorts of hate, including death threats. And you would think maybe people would care about that, too. But no, it's just the rapey photo. Which, again, we know was non-consensual, but are keeping anyways. Yep. And finally tonight, in Gallows Humor News, there has been another by-election held in the UK. And quite an unusual this time, because it didn't come about because a Tory MP was convicted of sexual assault, found guilty of corruption, or radicalised into a QAnon cult. Huh. Oh, they did all four at once this time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Marsh, is a by-election one that fucks both Labour and the Tories? Or... <laughs> Pin in that. <laughs> and so the by-election in Rochdale <laughs> actually came about because Labour MP Sir Tony Lloyd passed away while in office. And, and often when that happens, other parties don't contest the seat. So the incumbent party's new candidate just kind of takes over. But obviously those days of reason and norms are like long behind us by this point. Oh, wow, Marsh, it must be really hard to watch the opposing party sink to the depths of, let me check my notes here, running for office in a way that's not quite cricket. I'm holding you in the light, buddy. (laughs) Holding you in the light. So instead, what happened was Rochdale became the site of an 11-way election race. Or it would have been, except Labour were forced to disown their own candidate, Azhar Ali, after he claimed that Israel deliberately allowed the October 7th attack to take place as a green light to level Gaza. And the problem was by the time those horrible comments had emerged, it was already too late for Labour to like run a new candidate because the ballots had already been printed. So we had to watch Labour disown their candidate and kind of forfeit the race entirely. Ah, oh, hey, Eli, remember when our country would disavow a candidate when they endorsed irrational conspiracies? That's crazy. <laughs> no, not really. Honestly, I was really young. <laughs> so that left an opportunity for another party to step in. And that's an opportunity the Green Party spectacularly squandered after they were also forced to disown their own candidate who was still on the ballot at Guy Otten over a series of Islamophobic remarks that he'd made on Twitter. Right. And by Islamophobic, we mean that in 2013, he tweeted, the Quran is full of war, slaughter, rape and pillage with genocide and slavery as well. It is not fit for the 21st century, which is just a blatantly true thing to say. But but to be fair, about 20 percent of Rochdale's population is Muslim. And I know better than to run for mayor of a town in Alabama based on what I've said about the Bible. So (laughs) it's It's not good politics. It's really stupid politics. (laughs) Uh, you're right. Like, if he'd like, we can post a bunch of the shit we said when we read the the Quran ourselves to make his tweet seem <laughs> mild in comparison. I guess, I, guy, we got you, buddy. We got you. <laughs> so that's Labour and the Greens out. Uh, Reform UK, which is the party headed up by Lawrence Fox, they all but conceded their chances when they chose as their candidate Simon Danchuk who, on the plus side, actually has hands-on experience of being the MP for Rochdale, but on the negative side, he had to stop being their MP when he was discovered to be sexting a 17-year-old girl at the time. Oh, yes. God. Yeah. Or, as the Quran would call it, courting an old maid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not the kind of hands-on experience we were looking for. Man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So surely then with all of this, the Tories must have had an open goal in Rochdale. Well, not so much. Partly because they are currently historic levels of unpopular in this country, but partly also because they ran the candidate Paul Ellison, who was so bland and anonymous, they couldn't even find a photo for him for the Wikipedia page about the (laughs) by-election where they list the candidates. If you go to that page, instead of the picture of him, Wiki just has like a box with his party affiliation written in it, which is somewhat entertainingly abbreviated to 
con because like never has the Tory party been more adroitly summarized than that. I love that the Tory's main problem is that he's a Tory though. That's he's great. A- That's good stuff. <laughs> So with every other party shooting themselves in the foot or tripping over their own racism and sexual impropriety, the way was paved for professional blowhard George Galloway of the Workers' Party of Great Britain. And the fact that his success was definitely only down to the ineptitude of the other parties was not going to stand in Galloway's way because he declared his win as being for Gaza. Something I'm sure went down brilliantly with his new constituents, who probably would have preferred the win to be a bit more for Rochdale than for yeah, Gaza. Right. Although, in reality, like all elections featuring George Galloway, this win was only ever really for George Galloway. That's what this was for. Right. Well, yeah. So, listeners, if you want a measure of how seriously you should take this asshole, George Galloway has a signature hat. Right, but show does. me a sane person with a signature, and also he looks like if a moldy potato could own a haunted bookstore. He does, yeah. It's... <laughs> so Galloway ran on a mixed platform in Rochdale because he targeted the Muslim constituents with a heavily pro-Gaza message, while sanitizing all of that out of his pitch to the white residents, where instead he promised to quote make Rochdale great again which presumably was met with bafflement as to when Rochdale, a small town on the outskirts of Manchester, was ever the thriving heartbeat of civilization. <laughs> when people at a Man United game get onto the wrong train home, they will change trains <laughs> at the new Mecca. <laughs> Eli, I appreciate the amount of local research you did on that joke. Thank Fantastic you. Work. <laughs> I was looking at a train schedule for minutes, Mark. <laughs> minutes. <laughs> So Galloway is no stranger to winning elections in the UK, having spent the 90s as MP for Glasgow Hillhead, a role that he used in order to arrange a sit-down meeting in the 90s with Saddam Hussein in 1994. And in that meeting, he was criticised for completely fawning over the warmonger and telling Saddam how much he admired his courage, his strength and his indefatigability. And then in 2005, Galloway got back into office as MP for Bethnal Green in London. But the only notable thing he did during that five-year spell in office was to appear on Celebrity Big Brother, where he pretended to be a cat and very, very creepily mimed lapping milk out of the cupped hands of the actress Rula Lenska. Was that also for Gaza? Has he said? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was said also. Yet. Okay, in his defense, I would submit that there is no non-creepy way to mime lapping milk out of Rula Lenska's hands. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can't that's think fair. of one anyway. So in response to Galloway's election, Rishi Sunak called an emergency meeting of the press and delivered a speech outside of number 10 explaining that extremists like Galloway are a threat to British democracy. Which, you know, as much of an egotistical cock as Galloway is, it's a bit melodramatic to call him that. Given how little time Galloway spent doing his job of MP during the times he was representing Glasgow, Bethnal Green, or later Bradford, the only threat George Galloway poses is to the chances of the people of Rochdale getting any kind of competent representation in Parliament. (laughs) Well, and given the slate of alternative candidates, that was never in the cards to begin with. Right, Yeah, Yeah. exactly. But still, like, Rishi, if you're so against Galloway sitting in Parliament, there's this one simple trick to sort that whole thing out. <laughs> it's called a general election. There you because go. <laughs> if Sunak called a general election tomorrow, Parliament oh, would wish. be dissolved. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Parliament would be completely be dissolved and Galloway would not be the MP for Rochdale anymore. And there'd be almost no chance that he'd win the Rochdale seat for a second time. Plus, even if he somehow did win that seat, Rishi doesn't have to worry because... There's absolutely no chance he'd still be in a position where it's Rishi Sunak's problem to deal with. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> right, there sure. you go. There you go. And on that note, we're going to close things out. Thanks to Eli Bosick, thanks to Michael Marshall, and thanks to all the listeners who liked us and followed us on all the various social media platforms. Please keep doing that. Please keep listening, and please keep telling your friends. And if you find the naive stupidity of our giving away a free show business model to be oddly charming, you can send us gifts of money at patreon.com slash just like all the people that Heath will thank by name on the next episode if he feels like it. I'm sorry, there's just no predicting that kind of shit. You can't promise. We can't make those (laughs) promises here. And whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like those fine people, if you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes free of charge, check out our brother and sister shows The Scathing Atheist, God Awful Movies, TND Minus, and Citation Needed, available on all the podcast places. We just have one last thing. Let's compliment that penist. Special thanks to Ryan Slotnick of Evil Drops on Mars. He's the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings that you heard today, which were used with his permission. You should definitely check him out using the links we'll provide or by googling the only band called Evil Drops on Mars. Until next time, catchphrase sign off.
Yeah, I guess that would be Nick Light that I'm thinking of. Yeah. 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 That's fine. All British JOI should begin with hello, hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Now that's better help. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> the preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm LLC, copyright 2024, all rights reserved.